Morning, everyone. Hi, welcome from the cold and rainy uh, Cape Town. Thanks for joining us this morning. You've you've joined us to listen to Dr. Franz Cronier. We've uh, had him on a couple of months ago, six or seven months ago, and this is more of a follow-on in light of the recent events that have just gone on. I just want to get through a bit of the housekeeping. So as the participants start joining here, please make sure that you have a look. There's a chat function uh, and Q&A. Please, as uh, France goes through his presentation, stick in your questions and, and we'll have a little short time at the end where we can uh, ask and have some questions answered. Very, very topical at the moment. Um, looking back at the presentation that we had, we were talking about the rise or fall of South Africa. And that was uh, really interesting. And we were chatting earlier now, just saying how in the last six or seven months has the world changed. It's, it's dramatic what has happened in such a short space of time. So we're really excited to hear what's going on in terms of the RAND and the currency. Obviously, we're in the currency game at Currencies Direct. Uh, yeah, we went from 19 to the dollar uh, at the beginning of last year through to 16 at, in October. Then we had our presentation in November. And last month, we were at 13.30 to the dollar. So if there's volatility, the RAND is certainly uh, demonstrating it. So we're going to move over to Dr. Cronier, let me just introduce him, and he's obviously going to give us a little insight into what's going on. What I'd like you to do, if possible, is go back to our YouTube channel, Currencies Direct South Africa on YouTube, and have a look at the previous webinar that we had, The Rise or Fall. It's really, really interesting. I listened to it last night. It's got the four different scenarios that uh, France played out there, and in light of recent events, what has happened, uh, we're obviously going to hear more and, and understand you know, have things changed? Which direction have they moved? So looking forward to that. Uh, Franz Crenier, he was educated at St. John's College and Bits University, holds a PhD in scenario planning from Northwest University. He's the CEO of the IRR and directs the Center for Risk Analysis. The IRR is a public policy think tank established in 1929 to promote human rights in South Africa. The Center for Risk Analysis was established in 2010 and advises on global and South African political, economic, social, and political risk. The point here is they have got data, they've analyzed it, and we're going to present a couple of scenarios, and this is food for thought. This is not to persuade you or dissuade you to think about anything. It's, it's to ponder the scenarios that are out there and to make your own decision with the, uh, what is presented to you. So. Over to you, Franz. Looking forward to it. Right, Graham, colleagues, good morning, everybody. Let me get some charts up on the screen for you. And then I will explain what has just happened and what's going to happen next. We're going to do that in uh, 20 minutes or so. And uh, then we've got a little bit of time to put your questions to me. It's the high tide of revolution in South Africa. That's not uh, uh, our wording. We drew that from here. I want to spend a minute on this because it's the perfect summation of what happened. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take you through it quickly. Because of the growth in taxation, the rise in rents demanded by landlords, uh, there's famine and banditry everywhere. Isn't that dramatic? The peasant masses and the urban poor can hardly keep alive. Students fear that their education is not going to work out because production is backward, what that means is the economy is not expanding. This is written in 1930. Many graduates have no hope of employment. Once we understand all these contradictions, we will see in what a desperate situation, in what a chaotic state China finds herself. And we'll see that the high tide of revolution against the imperialists, the warlords, and the landlords is inevitable and will come very soon. That was Mao writing to his disillusioned revolutionary colleagues. And when this quote was put to me uh, two weeks back by James Myberg, who runs a very brilliant politics web, uh, website that you, it's a good source of information, uh, I said to James, exactly, Mao got this thing spot on. Let me show you why. I'm going to take you through, through eight areas and then uh, give you some concluding thoughts. What happened two weeks ago is perfectly in line with well-established long-term protest trend lines for the country. You're looking at a chart, runs from 97 to 2019, and I'm showing you the number 
that uh, goes up to four and a half thousand there of the left hand axis of violent protest actions in the country. And what the data uh, shows you, let me put up a pointer and then things become easier, is that for the first decade of our democracy, we were calming down and remaining re relatively calm by our standards. And in the second decade, things just absolutely took off. What also took off is what you see on the second chart, the intensity of protest action. This measures what proportion of all protests that occurred were violent. And by the sort of end of our first decade, that figure was down to around 5%. It has now taken off. It's around 30%. The data is good on the broad strokes. On the specifics in latter years, I think it's become a significant undercount of the extent of protest action. Now, what underpins these trends. Let's start with the people who run the country, the, the ANC. 94 to 2020, that is ANC support in national elections. So it increased in the first decade and it decreased in the second decade and it bottomed out really low, 57% in the 2019 election and plot the number of violent protests against that and we're quite simple analysts. Uh, we, we, we tend to think uh, maybe there's something going on here, that as confidence in the ANC falls, we're seeing more protest action. Take that same ANC marker of the electoral performance and plot the intensity of protests, the proportion that are violent. And again, the, you know, it's up to you. You make the call. You think something's going on here. My colleagues and I certainly... Uh, do as frustration builds up with the ANC, protest action becomes more violent. Let's go to an economic marker, employment. It's the best one to measure how ordinary people experience the economy. 1994 to 2021, in fact, first quarter 2021, that's the number of people with a job. If you saw me a few months ago for Currencies Direct, I took you into a lot of this kind of, 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 of data. The story is that we roughly doubled the number of people with jobs from about 8 million to just a shy of 15 million in our first decade as a democracy. Second decade, a real slowdown in job creation. The lockdowns crushed jobs. And today we're sitting basically where we were sitting more than a decade ago. Plot the number of violent protests against the labor market and when the economy creates uh, jobs relatively quickly, we don't see much happening on protests. As soon as the labor market slows down, the protest numbers take off, the violent ones, and the proportion of protests that are violent take off pretty much at the same time. Go to a more macro indicator, GDP per capita and protest action. What does that show? Well, there's real GDP per capita from 94 into this year. And the story is, a, by South African standards, a significant uh, recovery for you know, 10, 13 years, uh, 14 years after 94. The financial crisis, then the slow fighting our way back to where we used to be. Now, a slow increase in per capita GDP after a fast increase is politically as destabilizing as no increase. We'll plateau, and now one, two, three, four, five, six years in, we are falling, and we're, we're now still very low relative to what we, what we were. There's the number of violent protests. There seems to be something here. And the intensity of protest actions plotted against GDP, the suggestion from the numbers is that when life stops getting better, South Africans start getting fed up and they take to the streets. And when life really turned downwards in this crushing economic lockdown, we set the scene for that detonation that Mao warned about on China in his 1930 letter. Let's go to another macro one, fixed investment and protest action. This is gross fixed capital formation for South Africa. It's very volatile. Read it cautiously. I would have shown it to you before. But the broad stroke stuff is right. A recovery after the Asian financial crisis, 
and then a very disappointing performance thereafter. And that disappointment has persisted into the era of uh, the, the, the post-Zuma era. Protest numbers over fixed investment levels and protest intensity over fixed investment levels. And all this stuff starts pointing for us pretty firmly in one direction. Go to social grants. Those have just been a new sort of grant systems just been extended. And we're looking at a move now to a basic income grant for South Africans. All of that will be on top of an already, uh, by emerging market standards, the most expansive social welfare system of any emerging market. There it is. The number of social grants paid every month from 96 into 2019-20, we're up from 2 million to just under 20 million. The number of violent protests, as soon as that grants curve really started to slow, we see the protest marker move as well. What's also happening here, you don't see it in the chart, is grants are not increasing at the rate of inflation anymore as experienced by poor households. We experience inflation at a higher level than, than the CPI indicator uh, would suggest. And you see the same thing with the intensity of protest. Now, no one of these things created this protest surge. It's the confluence of a stagnating labor market, of falling investment levels, of falling real per capita GDP, of stagnating and the later sub-inflationary grants increases. The relationship between the socioeconomics and the political in South Africa is very well established. And it's the reason why in our notes, we send a note on a Monday morning to clients. We warned on seven occasions in the past 18 months in that note to expect an explosion of anarchic violence and looting. And that wasn't because we knew of some plotting. That was because we understood the implications of the consequences socioeconomically of the lockdown and what that would, would bring about. So none of this stuff was was came out of the blue it's all perfectly in line with well-established trend lines and well understood south african relationships where to from here let's start with the anc that's the number of people with jobs over the democratic era you saw it in red earlier now it's in black remember 8 million becomes 14 million becomes still 14 point something million ANC support on top of that. This stuff we believe in our team, major driver of, of, of the long-term political equation. What, are the, what is the polling showing? 2019 national election, that's the result. The ANC got 57. Ipsos polled them at 55 around that time. On the same methodology, Ipsos put them at 50 amidst the lockdown and we put them at just below 50 a couple of months after Ipsos. None of these numbers, except for the middle two, are strictly comparable for various reasons. I don't have the time to go into. But what they're suggesting is that there has been a 10% climb down, five percentage points in ANC support that I now estimate is probably sitting in the very low 50 percentiles going into our next election. There's some DA and EFF numbers. I don't want to get into those, but don't, don't buy into them too much. There's methodological reasons why the gray one, the DA, is difficult to poll. It's, it's sitting higher than what this number suggests. ANC support by age group. That also comes out from us. Um, we now find that for people under the age of 50, this is ANC support by your age category, so for people aged 16 to 50, we are polling the ANC at below 50%. For people aged 50 and older, we've got them in the mid-50s. This is important because much of this right-hand column is reaching maximum life expectancy. It won't be a dominant force in the 2024-2029 elections. These are those voters. And it's a simple matter. Sometimes the analysis on South Africa is deceptively simple run a virtual election inside this group at the moment, and I don't think the ANC can win. Further to the downside for that party and uh, uh, indicative of the extent of volatility we're going to go through in the next decade 
is that the party has run out of the money that it needs to govern the country successfully. 1913, the early days of the Union of South Africa into 2023, that is the budget deficit with the latter three lines being Tito Mbaweni's February forecast. Even if he pulls off the forecast, he might do so. The whole has only been eclipsed on three previous occasions. The 80s, when in the aftermath of Chase Manhattan's decision on calling the loans, we set up the political transition of the 90s. The whole of the Second World War, which set up the defeat of General Smuts in 1948, and prior to that, the First World War. Deficits change governments because governments run out of the resources to run their societies. This is this is a supporting, playing a supporting role in our broader thesis. Was it a, you'll get a copy of this, I'm sure, so you can go through this table slowly. Was it a coup? No, it wasn't a coup, and it wasn't even an insurrection. All protest actions are planned events. There's always planning. There's always scheming. There's always getting people out onto the streets. There's a significant degree of looting and destruction of public property. There's amazing data on how many cell phone masks are looted in a normal week in order to, to steal the the batteries and components and the like. We've done a little table here of the difference between a protest action and the difference between a coup or a planned insurrection. Political organization behind the action is not the distinguishing feature. More important are, are the, 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 the primary targets, the role of looting. Looting does not have a big role in a coup because you don't you, you, you want to take over the government, you want to inherit a state of anarchy. Targeted attacks on security forces, we didn't see that. The prominent use of the armaments of war. Remember, we use the armaments of war to rob cash trucks in South Africa on a daily basis. It was incidental to this protest, not prominent. The participants, you need to see clearly delineated leadership emerge for it to qualify as a coup insurrection. It wasn't that. And a clearly uh, defined political objective needs to be present. We didn't see that in South Africa. So our call, it was organized, but it's not a coup or an insurrection. Why is the government calling it a coup? They're calling it a coup because they want to evade responsibility for uh, uh, the, 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 the blow up by um, creating the impression that some dastardly group of people planned this and therefore interrupted South Africa's reform agenda, when the real blame for this, in our view, lies in the fact that there's not a reform agenda that's improving people's lives and our well-established trends are playing out. I've got two minutes and we're going to end uh, perfectly on time. We're going to be inside time even. Where to from now? Option one. This decade, clean electoral defeat of the ANC. They lose an election and walk away. There's a coalition era that follows that, and then the emergence of a new political movement, perhaps an alliance with the better parts of the ANC, perhaps some sort of DA-ANC conflagration. And South Africa is relatively well governed, recovers into the 2030s, replicating what happened here in the immediate aftermath of 94. Outcome two, it's messy, it's violent. The ANC might be losing and might cheat, might refuse to go. You could see coalitions with the EFF coming to take over the ANC and expropriate the whole, the whole thing. What happens as a consequence there, if we don't get a clean break and the emergence of a new clear political offering that can govern the country out of Pretoria, is we're headed for the breakup of the union, and that's the union of 1910. South Africa is a young country. It's only been going for 110 years. Most of those have been pretty shambolic. No one who sat in Pretoria has actually pulled it off to run the country effectively to the advantage of all its people. As the state fails and recedes, running out of money being the primary indicator there, the vacuums it leaves in its wake will be filled by new actors taking upon themselves, they'll be the most powerful uh, actors in their communities, what were once the functions of the state, 
the militias guarding them schlanger and the taxi industry guarding shopping malls is a is a is an indication of this but as you know if you live in the country or know it well that move towards enclave formation where communities take upon themselves what were once state functions it's not a new phenomenon it's been coming for a good 12 13 14 years and south africa ends up as a as a de facto uh, a confederation of independently run citadels or or stockades uh, some of which might be very successful and that is it for me um i give this back to to our hosts and try and answer some of your questions thank you thanks Franz. wonderful jeepers yeah there's a lot of a lot of questions coming in as well so um just quickly, the you know, if the ANC lose, I mean, your two scenarios that you're saying at the end there is basically you're saying the ANC are set to lose. Um, is there is there a scenario where they win and they and they remain in power? Where they win cleanly and remain in power, there is, but that that requires now sweeping reforms. And uh, we, in our broader scenario, said what we shared with you guys a couple of months ago. We we indicate that is a that that is a outcome, but we write it down now to such an extent that we're not spending much time thinking about it. The, the administration is not reformist in the main. The types of reforms necessary to see South Africa come out on top as a very competitive high growth emerging market are unacceptable to the balance of the cabinet. And we don't think they're going to happen. We're doubling down on that view in the aftermath of these riots. Because this really was a, a milestone. And if in the aftermath of this riot, the government's not moving quickly to reform in the labor market, on property rights and the like, but rather doubling down on these chasing these, these ghosts and goblins of insurrection, what it says to us is finally is that nothing is ever going to prompt this administration to introduce the deep and sweeping reforms to see our growth rate, because that's what reform must do, rise to match that of comparable emerging markets, or the emerging market average, about 4.5% over the next decade. Graham. Sure. Uh, last time when we were talking about the rise or fall, you spoke about the majority that aren't voting, and they're essentially the party that hasn't been formed yet or created. Do you see rise of this party or is there anyone that's putting their hand up to, to lead this majority of non-voters? The market for it is there, definitely. If it's, if, uh, uh, so that's not a problem. The, um, what's missing is two things. One is it needs a big budget, a couple of billion rand, and that's not available because for, for many reasons, including that the, the high net worth types that could back it, I'm still hoping that there's some resolution, some new dawn uh, prospect within the ANC. Until the ANC is gone, I don't think that thinking is going to change. Second problem, just as serious, is that um, there are actually quite few elite institutions or serious influences in the country, even outside of the government, that are willing to countenance the kind of policy reforms that South Africa would need now if it was to become a truly competitive emerging market. You need to scrap EWC in its entirety. You need to be done with national health insurance, which is essentially EWC for the same thing. You need to abandon a minimum wage uh, prescriptions and the horizontal application of bargaining, the forced horizontal application of bargaining council agreements. So the market is there 100%, yeah. But the backing financial and the backing of the relevant policies and ideas, there's, there's not a clear indicator that that's going to happen. So potential, absolutely. In practice, we don't see two of the key ingredients, which means you might lean now more towards the enclave outcome. But it's too early now to make that call firmly. You must see what happens in that first five years after an ANC defeat. And uh, 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 then, then so, so the two that I've given you now, I'd say you, 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 you kind of split them 50-50. Graham. 
Thanks, France. I've got a question here from Richard as well, uh, summarized. Since the 1990s, we've seen two main feelings. One, the rich are getting richer. Two, we see minimal benefits from improvements as a result of there's been an increase in, in the poverty gap. Do we need social change and greater sharing of wealth? No, I'd say that's wrong. The analysis is flat wrong. The, um, the, uh, some South Africans have done very well. But the lift in basic living standards of people has been very significant. We doubled the number of people with jobs in that first decade. Um, in terms of the rise of a black middle class, I can quote a really stunning stat at you that in 91, there were 40 whites getting degrees in engineering for every one black kid getting an engineering degree. Now there are significantly more black than white engineers graduating, but the number of white engineers is not less than it was in 1991, even though the population hasn't moved much. We've achieved in terms of lifting living standards uh, uh, far more than the country, its people, the taxpayers, the government, and even the ANC was ever credited with. So I think it's an analytical mistake to say the poverty gap opened, the rich got richer, the poor didn't benefit at all. They benefited to an enormous extent for 15 years. But in the latter decade, as policy became hostile, as, as, as corruption rose, as confidence collapsed and investment fell, I showed you the fixed capital formation line. The effect was that the growth rate got stunted and then the job market got stunted and then the deficit blew out and then the welfare system got stunted. That's the reason behind these social frustrations. The, the replicate the model of, of the gear era of Mandela and Mbeki and do that for 20 years, South Africa comes out on top as a middle-income society with an unemployment rate of below 10%. Graham. Last two questions, Franz. Thanks very much. This is uh, incredibly insightful and exciting. Isn't it exciting? I mean, the, the developments that are going on in our country, it's, you know, it, it's nonstop action. One question from Jonathan, one of our longest standing clients. Um, He's asked, if the ANC do lose power to the coalition, will they relinquish power peacefully? I used to say yes. Now I'm not sure after this. This thing wasn't a coup, but the violence within it. There are people who know how to plan coups in South Africa. They were trained in East Germany. If they'd done it, it, it would have been done properly, not the this, this shambles of stealing televisions and things that, that it became. I used to say, yeah, they'll go quietly. But I think the scale of the violence has shown some of those individuals what potential there exists to actually evade the consequence of an election defeat. So at the moment, I'm saying that's not guaranteed at all. And I used to say, I don't think it's a risk. It's one of the calls I got wrong. It's the reason why I have the enclave option because the enclave option happens where the state refuses, the ANC refuses to accept a result. We're now in a position where there's a proposal to delay the election in October. It is very dangerous. We're delaying it because of COVID is the proposal, but you can queue for social grants. You can, you can go to the pub, you can get on an airplane, but the idea is it's too dangerous to stand in a queue to vote. That's crap. What's going on here is the fear of what that result is going to be, because based on the consequences of lockdown, that October result, it's a local poll, but if you average it, the ANC could well be under 50. And if it goes under 50 once, the psychological effect, you know, it just gets people thinking about new ideas and a new, it was unthinkable a few years ago. We said in 2014, we think the ANC loses in 2024. And gee, we got, we got hammered for that one, as this was the most absurd suggestion we'd ever made. And we, we've, 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 we live on the edge of limbs. That's where we reside. And it's a treacherous existence. It's an exciting country. I'm not sure that they're going to go peacefully. But even if they don't, the enclave future allows communities that buy into it robustness they can do very well in those circumstances. Um, uh, I'll give Graham a, give me one, one minute. 
For 400 years, this has been a wild corner of the world. That was interrupted between 1992 and 2007, when for 15 years, South Africa was well governed to the advantage of all its people in the main. My earlier question about the poor and the rich applies here particularly. What happened recently is that we've gone back to what we've been over 400 years, a wild corner of the world, unpredictable, violent, poorly governed. But for all of that, the state the country is in today, in terms of its infrastructure, in terms of living standards, in terms of the firms that do business in it, life has really never been much better than this. And, and I mean, 10 years ago, it was better. Real per capita GDP is dipping. And, and I think if you do really well in a future South Africa, you, you're going to pull off this apparent contradiction. When your offshore mates call you and say the army is on the streets, the people are, are, are the residents of Schlanga brought out their shotguns they use for grouse hunting in order to maintain law and order. And you tell them, listen, it is, it's harsh, but we, we're managing pretty well in these circumstances. Get that mind shift right. And I think amidst all the volatility, South Africa remains a place someone can do relatively well. Graham. Right, I hope so. I just, uh, you know, that, that debate, should I stay or should I go, is always present. I just bought a house, so I'm laying my roots down, got young kids, they're going to stay here for a long time. I'm passionately South African, so uh, hoping, hoping for all the improvements. Last question, just before we go. So, if the um, do you see a split in the ANC, and could Cyril be one of the guys to go off and and lead this opposition? The ANC split in two thousand and seven, uh, when Mbeki left. That's when the pragmatists got out, and the technocrats and the people that had pulled off the successes of the first fifteen years, and they haven't gone back. And no, Ramaphosa is not going to be that guy. That decision was an option. I can tell you, uh, three years ago. If Ramaphosa had booted the rubbish to the curb in the ANC and dealt with whatever blow up, even if ANC support had then fallen from, well, it got 57%, was then probably at about 60. Let's say he'd lost a third of it and he'd gone to 40%. Or well, let's say he'd gone, lost half of it. He'd gone to 30%, which wouldn't have happened. He's very popular amongst ordinary people. If he'd knocked on the door of the opposition and said, listen, gentlemen, I'm kicking the, the, the rubbish out of my party and things are going to get really hot. Will you make a deal in coalition with me that the pragmatists of the ANC can get together with the DA and try and govern the country? That would have happened. That decision was rejected. And it would have been the salvation, I think. So, no, I don't think he's that guy. Graham. Franz. We're going to leave it there. Thank you so much, Jeepers. What a, as you say, it's the Wild West. Things have changed. Seven months, we've seen huge volatility in the RAND. We've seen people immigrate. We've seen people buy houses and, you know, lay down foundations. We've seen opportunity rise. We've seen COVID go into three, four cycles. Uh, it's exciting. But from Cape Town, uh, Currencies Direct, we just want to thank all of our people. Thank you, Dr. Franz Crenier, for your insights. Uh, for our audience and, and our partners, thank you for joining us. Thank you for spending the morning with us and, you know, make your own decisions. No one's telling you what to think. This is just data for you to interpret and, and, and come up with your own interpretations. Thank you so much for your time. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and we'll see you soon. Cheers from Cape Town.